Okay, so introduction to Simone Weil. Uh, we are now entering finally, you know how you go in a race and you're running like crazy and then you cool down? This is the cool down, <laughs> right? We had crazy times with Nietzsche, Marcel, leaving us. It got harder and harder, <laughs> right? Now, actually, with Simone Veil, we're going to have some respite. She's not hard to read at all. <laughs> there are no crazy concepts, right? No big technical philosophical concepts. She's a very easy read. Um, so um, there's not much to explain, right? So today will be a little shorter than usual, which is nice. <laughs> I think I'm sure we all appreciate. Um, so I'm going to introduce, first of all, her bio. So that's number one. And that's really the most important. And then I'll just talk briefly about her thought. So we're going to be done in almost maybe 20 minutes, <laughs> 25 minutes. So we should be good. Okay. Um, so first of all, right, she's born in 1909. Oops. Um, I think she dies. Um, when did she die? <laughs> Somebody add, oh, 1943. So she, she died pretty young, actually. And we'll see why in a second. But uh, so she's, so remember, I told you from now on, we'll be in France, right? After Nietzsche, we moved to Paris. <laughs> so we had Marcel, then we had Levinas, and now Simone Veil is also in Paris. Uh, and it's all around the same time, right? Marcel was World War I, Levinas is World War II, and also Simone Veil, right? Um, I don't think she knew any of these guys, though, to be honest. <laughs> I'm trying to look at the dates. Um, yeah they weren't in the same circles. <laughs> so uh, let me tell you a little bit about her so you have an idea, right, who she is and also why she looks, why she has dressed so funny on the cover of the book. I don't know if you noticed the book, but she's wearing some kind of weird overalls. So I'm going to talk about that. So she was born in Paris, right, also to Jewish parents, but completely agnostic, right? Unlike Levinas, who was really um, raised in a religious context, right? And you see that in his writing. She was raised in a completely atheistic context, right? Um, they were pretty comfortable, pretty wealthy. Her father was a doctor. Her brother was a well-known mathematician. And she herself was also pretty uh, precocious intellectually. She was, I mean, <laughs> I can blow you away with some of her um, accomplishments <laughs> when she was 12. By the time she was 12 years old, she was fluent in Greek, <laughs> for instance, right? I mean, this was normal. Kids at the time got a kind of, they were educated like that. Uh, but in addition to that, she learned Sanskrit. So anybody can tell me what is Sanskrit? Which, which language? Which, um, which part of the world are we talking about with Sanskrit? Does anybody know? Yes, very good, Ali, right? This is the India sacred, uh, sacred writing, right? So the scriptures coming from the Hindu tradition are often written in Sanskrit. So she actually read the Bhagavad Gita when she was a, a kid. <laughs> so the Bhagavad Gita is one of the most well-known sacred texts of India. She fell in love with that story, right? And so she wanted to read it in the original. <laughs> so she taught herself Sanskrit. And this is all around her teenage years, right? So you can see already the, um, like how her mind is already completely developed. <laughs> um, so she actually, she, she was um, very much interested in, in Hinduism for a while. And um, we'll talk about um, how that influenced her thought, but she was very much interested in not only Hinduism, but also Chinese thought. We're going to talk about uh, Taoism in a second. So, uh, and, sh and so she was always trying to, you know, get as close as she could to this text by learning the original language. She didn't learn Chinese, but <laughs> she tried to learn Sanskrit. So anyways, she, um, she went to a very uh, prestigious high school. She studied under one of um, the most famous philosophers of France, whom you will never read or know, but I'll write his name anyways. His name is Alain. Um, he hasn't been translated, sadly, but he has amazing works, right? So she studied with this guy in high school. And then later she did, um, she entered university and she passed the, the highest exam to become a um, a teacher in high school for philosophy and she beat just fun fact right if you're familiar with the french feminist uh, simone de beauvoir let me see i'm writing her name um 
So this is a fun fact. Simone de Beauvoir is one of the most, you know, famous French feminists. They were in the same class together and Simone Veil beat her, <laughs> right? She got a better grade than her in the final exam. So just a fun fact. Okay, so she ended up teaching philosophy at a high school for girls. Um, in France, we actually teach philosophy in high school. It's one of the main subjects. Um, so kind of like math or chemistry, we, we consider philosophy to be an important subject. So, so she was teaching and that's kind of where she ended up, right? So, so that gives you a little idea of her mind, her training, her background. Um, for sure, she was brilliant intellectually, even though that you will see when she writes, because she's really, the, these essays are really kind of um, written almost for herself, right? She is grappling with religious ideas. These are almost like diary entries, right? They're, I mean, they're much better than diary entries, but she's really not trying to be academic. She's really uh, writing for herself, trying to um, find her own path spiritually through these essays. So she's not going to be as technical and academic as uh, Levinas and Marcel, right? Because this is really a writing which is coming from her own thirst for God, right? So she's very, the essays are very authentic, very um, uh, simple. The language is very uh, simple because it's simply her own journey, right? She's not trying to argue anybody. She's not against anybody, right? Like Levinas or Marcel. She's not trying to uh, argue for anything. These are her own explorations, right? So um, that's why they're so easy to read and, and um, so pleasant to read, right? Because she's really trying, it's, it's, it's her own deep thirst that is um, pushing her to write like she does, right? So very different style, right? The style we've been seeing so far is academic. They're grappling with Nietzsche, with other philosophers, trying to make an impact in the academic world, right? She's just writing for herself. <laughs> That's why her writing is very different. So in addition to being, um, uh, to having you know an intellect which is quite extraordinary she was also an activist um, very early as early as six years old let me tell you a few funny stories about her and her political activism right so in 1915 she's six years old and then at that time you have the first world war right so Marcel remembers a little bit older. He's already working for the Red Cross, right? She's, a, she's still a child. And so she hears that the French troops on the uh, front, right, uh, were not eating enough. They didn't have any sugar. They didn't have basic necessities. And she hears about that at six years old. And so she, she tells her parents she doesn't want to eat sugar anymore because she wants to be in solidarity with the French troops, right? So that's kind of giving you an idea of the mindset of the six-year-old six year Simone Veil, right? She feels so connected to these soldiers. She wants to suffer like they suffer. And so she tells her parents, don't give me sugar anymore. I want to suffer like them, <laughs> right? In a few years later, she's nine years old. Uh, she declares herself at the dinner table. She says, I am now a Bolshevik. So let me explain what that means so you can understand. <laughs> this is the equivalent of you being born in a conservative Christian family, so Republican Party, and you're, and, and, uh, meaning you are that, and then your child one day tells you, um, I'm going to be a communist, <laughs> right? A Bolshevik is another word for a communist, right? So, and her parents were conservatives, right? They would be today Republicans, right? They're more conservative. They have conservative values. They're uh, wealthy. So he, all of a sudden their daughter pops out with this idea that I'm now a communist, <laughs> right? So she's, you know, in, in the eyes of her parents, she has gone insane. So she, she continues, right? With the kind of, um, this kind of uh, burden, right, for the working class. She continues with this, even though she's not from the working class, right, she's from this kind of intellectual elite, right, she's still feeling the pain of the working class. So she actually um, gets involved in the workers' movement. She's, when she's a teenager, she's marching for better pay, uh, less exploitation, even though she's not working, right? <laughs> she's a teacher, right? But she is involved in the kind of fight for workers' rights. She takes it very far. At one point, she takes a leave of absence from her teaching job 
and actually goes to work in what would be considered today, I don't know, GM Motors, right? Uh, car, car manufacturing, right? In French, it's the car that she went to work for was Renault. I don't know if you know the French, um, um, this is a brand, right, of, of French, it's a French car. So she actually drops her teaching job, right? And you saw the picture in the book, right? And she goes to work in a car factory. So basically she's putting cars together. <laughs> um, and what she's wearing, right, on the cover of the book is actually the overalls that people wore in this car factory. So she's, you know, and she's there completely, you know, out of place. She, she's at the time so enthusiastic about Hindu philosophy. She wants to talk to everybody about it. But everybody in the car factory, they don't give a damn about <laughs> her findings, right? So she's constantly trying to start discussions about the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads. These are the sacred texts, right? And they're like, you know, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so, so, you know, after a while, she actually gets sick from the work. It's too hard. <laughs> So she has to, to stop. Um, but when she gets better, she starts again, trying to you know, continue for the working class. So in 1936, the Spanish Civil War breaks out. If you're familiar, this was really, um, there was a fascist government which had come to power and the people rose against it. Uh, and actually many people who were um, uh, sympathetic to the cause of the Spanish people came and helped to fight against this fascist government. And you had even people from the States somebody like Hemingway, right, who was a, a very famous novelist uh, in the States, uh, actually also went and joined the war to fight on the side of the people, right? So she wants to go. <laughs> so she goes. But she's so clumsy with the gun that she's actually shooting her own, <laughs> her own side. And so they beg her to leave. They're like, please, please leave you're making us feel unsafe like we're afraid you're going to shoot us right please go go home <laughs> right so she has to leave you know because she's just not cut out for this um i mean it's all very comical right until the end which is kind of tragic right um in 1942 the Germans invade France, and of course she wants to join the resistance, right? Uh, the resistance, uh, so the, the French government has now moved in exile, the legitimate, they moved to England, and then instead you have this kind of puppet government which is uh, sympathi uh, sympathizing with the Nazis, right? So, but the real government is in England, so she goes to England, and she wants to help with the resistance. And again, she gets sick, but this time fatally, right? She, she gets sick and she dies uh, very young at the age of 34. So, um, so it's kind of funny, but not funny, <laughs> right? She just was so, she, there was such a heightened sensitivity in her in the Levinasian sense, right? Remember Levinas talks about this, um, this, this sensitivity that we have towards suffering others, right? She had this really strong fiber of compassion, right? Which made her leave the, her comfort, right? The comforts that she was born into in order to suffer alongside, right? Others. So she went a little too far, right? She destroyed herself in the process. Thankfully, she had written a lot <laughs> by then, right? We have several essays, several books, right? That she wrote before the age of 34. Um, so now in addition to being a political activist and being, you know, intellectually precocious, she also was some, uh, something of a mystic, right? So even though she was raised secular, she always had a kind of um, longing for spirituality, right? Or something in her was uh, open to it, sensitive to it. And so she, she had a very um, poignant conversion uh, to Christianity. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So in 1935, let's see, she must be about in her 20s, <laughs> we're going to say. Um, and she's, of course, no knowledge of religion or nothing, but she's visiting Portugal and she stumbles upon a little church of a little village church, which is having its service outside, right? And they're singing and they're kind of maybe on the beach, you know, and they're just singing. And it's just a very uh, beautiful, simple um, landscape right and she remembers being so moved right by what she's seeing the simplicity the authenticity the sincerity of the villagers uh just moves something in her and this is the beginning of her journey right towards christianity later she's in italy 
and she's in a small church, right, um, dedicated to the Saint uh, Francis of Assisi. And there too, right, she feels some kind of um, calling, right, to, to follow into the Christian, um, to have a Christian journey, right? Um, so she's kind of very much interested in, in Catholicism, which was the main religion of France at the time. But, and this is interesting about her, she never got baptized, right? If you see in the book that we're studying, if you read the other texts, these are letters between her and the priest, that is her mentor. And you sense the priest, right, is telling her, well, you know, maybe now is the time to take the step, to get baptized, to enter the church. And she writes back and she says, no, I'm not going to get baptized. And here's why, she says. She says, I love the world too much to leave it behind, right? Remember that baptism means you're leaving behind the world. You're separating yourself from the world and entering this holy community, right? And she says, no, I don't want to enter a holy community. I want to stay <laughs> with the people here because I love them, because I feel solidarity with them. I don't want to be part of a holy community and find salvation when all of these people are left to their own devices. So she actually refuses to <laughs> get baptized out of solidarity for the world, right? Out of love for the world. Um, in addition to that, she, of course, she's mostly uh, delving into Christianity, but she's also interested in the Eastern philosophies and Eastern religions. And the two of them, two of the religions that intrigue her are Hinduism, of course, and the sacred texts that she's studying are the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads. So I would invite you, of course, to read those. These are very good. And then, of course, Taoism, which is a Chinese um, um, spiritual path um, and there you the main text is the Tao Te Ching and I'll come back to those right she's going to be referring to those texts in her writings so in preparation right for Monday I would suggest try to find online it's easy try to get the Upanishads or try to get um, especially the Tao Te Ching right she's referring to those to, to Chinese concepts um, and we'll talk about that in a second so she believes actually that all religions, when you go deep enough, you get to the same place. In other words, it's, it's as though the differences between religions are superficial, right? When you really go deeply into one faith, you will get to a destination which is pure love and which all religions share, right? Ultimately, she says all religions are there to teach us to love, right? And so even though there are surface differences, the gods look different, the temples look different, the, the scriptures are different, but ultimately it's the same message, right? She really believed that all religions had the same message of teaching humanity how to love. So for her, she has no problem, right? Reading the Bible, reading the Upanishads, reading the Tao Te Ching, they're all saying the same thing, right, for her. Um, so very interesting, right? Kind of eclectic uh, kind of Christian. Um, okay, so let's get into uh, a little bit of her thought. I'm going to actually distinguish her from Levinas because they're in the same time, they're addressing the same problem, but differently, right? So the problem, remember, during the time of Levinas, um, <clears throat> especially, is the problem of the eclipse of God. We mentioned this, right? God seems absent. We don't see him. He's not doing what God is supposed to be doing. We don't sense his presence in the universe. In fact, the universe has gone dark, right? And this is really what happened during the Second World War, at least in Europe. It really felt like the universe, the whole world had gone dark, right? So there's no sense of God anymore. And so we saw how Levinas um, responds to this absence, right? To this question, where is God? And so I'm going to start with Levinas. We're going to review briefly Levinas, right? And then I will tell you what's how Simon Vale takes another direction, right? So remind me, where is God, according to Levinas, after the Holocaust? Where was God during the Holocaust? See if you remember. <laughs> yes, very good, Aline, very good, Williams, very good, Vargas, right? Absolutely, right? God was not up there, right? Uh, figuring things out. He was always among us and we missed him because we looked away, 
right? So God was among the wretched and to find God again, we need to turn to these, right? This is the only place where God can be found after the Holocaust, right? This idea of a heavenly God has become shattered. Um, and now all we have is the trace of God left in the people around us, right? So Simon Veil is going to answer slightly different. We're going to see that for her, where was God? She would ask, where were you, right? God moves through us. If we're not willing messengers or willing, um, you know, uh, partakers, right? We, God cannot move. So in, in many ways, right, we are the arms of God. We are the eyes of God. We are the feet of God. And if we don't move and do the godly thing, God doesn't exist, right? So she's going to put God in us, not in the other, right? We, this is where God is to be found. We are in a way the body of God, right? This is a very Christian idea, right? That the church is the body of Christ. She broadens it and she says, all of humanity is the body of God. And so if it is to the extent that we're open to the divine love that, and that we are willing to move right towards others in love, that God can be present in the earth, right? God moves through us. So let me write this down, right? So, um, so against, uh, Liv, uh, well, differently from Livinas, right? She says, um, God is in us, right? We are the body of God. In other words, God moves through us. And so if we are unwilling, right, um, to move lovingly towards the other, then God in a way is absent, right? So God depends on us to be in the world, to enter the world, because he actually has to first enter us. How open are we, right, to the love of God? How open are we to sharing the love of God? And if we are not open for this, if God doesn't have enough vessels in the world for his work, then there is no God, right? So she's going to talk about this. She's actually going to compare us to priests. And this is going to be very interesting. She's going to say every single human being, right, is, is like a priest which is kind of uh, sharing the body of God, the love of God with everyone around them, right? So we are not, so she's kind of talking a Catholic language, right? A Christian language, but she's actually going to be broadening some of these concepts to all of humanity. So when she talks about priests, she's saying all of us have the responsibility to be priests, to offer the love of God to others, right? And we'll see how that works. Um, so that's the first thing, right? The first distinction between Simon Veil and Levinas. Now, with regards to the second issue, right? Where, um, how can God be reached, right? So now we know where God is. How can God be reached? What was Levinas's answer? How can we still connect to God after the Holocaust? So it's obvious based on what we said. <laughs> can we connect personally or should we pick another way? Okay, very good, Suresh, right? We don't connect anymore directly, right? Because for living us, this is inappropriate. The only way left to connect to God is to connect to other people, right? So Simon Veil is going to say, well, no. <laughs> There's still a way to connect personally, right? But she says, the reason most of us can't do that, right, is because we are not in the proper stance. So let me explain, right? Um, for, for, for Simon Veil, if you're not in the right position, if you're not positioned correctly, you will miss, right, the voice of God, the connection with God. It's like um, a radio, right? You know how you have, um, do you remember the radios in the car where you turn the button? Let me see how many of you know what I'm talking about. Put your hand in the screen. Okay. So you know how when you don't have yet the, the station, it's like, bzzz, right? I don't hear anything until you turn it right. And then, ah, now you have music. Okay. <clears throat> She says it's like this for us too. If we are not properly, if we're not on the right frequency, we're going to get a lot of static. And a lot of us, this is our life. We have a lot of static. We, we, we want it. We would love to know that there is a God, right? But we're not sensing it. And it just feels like there's a lot of static. And Simon Veil is going to say the reason for that is you're not on the right frequency. You have to shift your position in order to have a kind of encounter. Uh, yes, Wilkes, go ahead. 
So basically, since she's saying that we're the body of God, does that mean that like we can't like we need to embrace that part of the body to like keep it alive? Something like that? I'm not sure. Uh, so these are two separate ideas, right? Um, if you put them together, you're going to get confused. Uh, first of all, we are the arms and legs of God. So in other words, if we don't love, if we don't allow God's love to, throw, to flow through us, it's like God doesn't, cannot enter the world. Does that first part make sense, Wills? Yes. So now this is the second part, right? Before you can become the body of God, you have to actually have some kind of receptivity, right? You have to have some, before God can inspire you to love and flow through you, you have to be, be a channel, right? And Simon Weil is saying most of us are not channeling, we're not even connecting to God. We just in the static. And so she's saying, in order to connect, we need to learn to reposition ourselves. We need to adopt a certain stance so that we can again become channels and then, of course, become the body of God. Does that make sense, uh, Wilkes? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, there was another issue. Yes, very good, Subhan Kulova. I'm, I'm getting to that. <laughs> so Subhan Kulova is asking, well, what would be the right stance, right? She wants to know. So we're, we're going to talk about that, right? This is, this is going to be the topic of our second lecture. Now, one hint I will give you, she's going to base herself here on a concept in the Tao Te Ching called passive activity. How many of you have heard of this concept of action which is a non-action or passive activity anybody familiar with this kind of paradox anybody have read this uh, no it's not the yin yang it's a way of acting which is passive or it's action which is a non-action uh whilst you're on the right path <laughs> so action which is non-action uh, it's not meditation, right? It's something else. So this is good. I'm going to give you the homework to look it up, right? Actually, let me get the, um, I think that's the right um, way to say it. Action, which is non-action or passive activity. I want you to guys, you guys to look it up because this is how she's going to explain the shift we have to make, right? Which we're going to find what it is. So Google it a little bit, try to find what it means because this will help you. Of course, I'll explain it, right? In class, but I want you to already read up on it so you can participate, right? Are we good? Put your hand in the screen if you got your homework. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so either passive activity or action, which is a non-action is the same idea, right? This idea, it's a paradox. Action, which is non-action, how does that work? Actually, let me Google it really quick to make sure. Oh, I can't when I'm recording, sorry. Can someone Google this? Tell me the exact uh, terminology. Um, who can do this for me right now? Put your hand in the screen. Uh, nobody? <laughs> I need one volunteer to do this. Google it right now and tell me if you find anything and what's the word of it. So passive action, passive activity or action in non-action. Uh, yes, it's Wu Wei. Thank you, Alim, you're on the right track. It's the Chinese concept of Wu Wei. You can also, go thank you, thank you. That's good, Alim. Action in inaction. Yes, action in inaction, is that how it is? Okay. Yeah. Good. So this is kind of the idea. In, in Chinese, Wu Wei, right? We're from Queens. We should get in touch with these ideas <laughs> for our Chinese community. Um, good. So I want you to, where are the Chinese? We have a bunch of Chinese in the class. Where are my Chinese? Where are they? Leong, are you Chinese? I am Chinese, but I'm not too familiar with what we're discussing, <laughs> but <laughs> it's something new. Okay. Lee, are you familiar with it? No? Yes? I, I didn't know about that. Okay, okay. Where is, where is Chen? Wait, no. Where's my other Chinese? I can't see everybody, anybody. That's it, I just have to check. Ah, there you are, Chen. <laughs> Familiar with it, Chen? You can unmute, so I know. No. Oh, ha oh there's Honglin. Hello, Honglin. <laughs> and Mei Chen, are you familiar with this? Not much. Okay. Well, we have to do this now. <laughs> right? This is one of the uh, very foundational concepts of Taoism, which is one of the main 
spiritual traditions of China, right? So China now is mostly secular, right? Which is why our Chinese students <laughs> are not as familiar as they could be, right? So, but these were ancient spiritual traditions, right? Which have gone a little bit um, on, on the, which have been a little bit marginalized, right? But we have to go back to these traditions to understand Simon Vick. So make sure you guys Google Wu Wei action in inaction. Very good, uh, Jasmine. The art of non-action, all of this is the same idea. Make sure you, you Google and study it so that you can be ready for this, uh, to answer Subon Kulova's question on what, how do we do the shift, right? We're gonna talk about that in detail. Okay, that's all <laughs> I had to say. Any questions? <laughs> We are done in record time. This is nice. All right, no questions? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.